I've got different times on my schedule here. So I'll pass now. Uh, it's my great introduction, great pleasure to introduce the two illustrious speakers we have with us. Uh, both have made and continue to make substantial contributions to the sustainability of the world's agriculture and food systems. Our first speaker will be Dr. Ruben Echeverria. Ruben is a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, in Washington, DC. I first met Ruben many years ago. I don't know exactly. for National Agriculture Research, and then as Executive Director of the Science Council of the CGIAR. Uh, Dr. Echeverria studied agronomy in Uruguay and agriculture and applied economics at the University of Minnesota. I'll also introduce that our second speaker, Dr. Mauricio Lopez, is a senior researcher at the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation, Embrapa, Agro and Nigeria in Brasilia, Brazil. So where he's joining us today. He is a member of the advisory group to the Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization, Rome. He has held a variety of positions with Embrapa, including Director of Genetic Resources and Biotechnology, Director of Research and Development, and from 2012 to 2018 as President. Throughout his time with Embrapa, um, there's Dr. Lopez has served in a number of national and international committees, missions, panels, and working groups, related to agricultural R&D. He's received numerous awards for his contributions, including the Medal of the Rio Branco Order by the Ministry of Foreign Relations of Brazil and an honorary doctorate from Purdue University. Dr. Lopez is a plant geneticist by training and received his BSc degree in agronomy from the Federal University of Bicosa, Brazil and his MS degree in plant genetics from Purdue University and his PhD in genetics from the University of Arizona in the US. So with that, over to you, Ruben. Uh, you can share your screen with us. Welcome. I hope, I hope you can see my screen with the two pictures. Yes, we can. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, this is a dialogue uh, for us. We are not professors, but uh, we love to engage with professors and with students we, we think uh, sustainable agriculture intensification is the way forward. We're totally convinced. And, uh, and we will try to talk about that in the next few minutes. And uh, so I, I will try to make the case uh, for sustainable intensification in general. And then we have one of the best cases on sustainable intensification coming with Mauricio from Brazil. So I really thank you, Professor Swallow and Dean Blade for the invite. And we hope that um, after COVID, perhaps we can pay a visit and, and check out the University of Alberta. Uh, it's been a pleasure for, you know, to, to be invited here. So on the global context uh, for, for sustainable agricultural intensification, uh, you, you have seen everybody, I think we are all sharing with this con global consensus on the huge challenges that we have ahead. And you have seen this slide perhaps with many more bullets. Um, you know, this is a, the major thing. Humanity never faced this altogether. We never had uh, to think about increasing demand for food by about half of it, half of what we are producing today, including animal-based uh, food. And uh, we, we haven't had before, um, thinking on nutrition and diets, not only food. We, we are thinking a lot on landscapes, and this is at the core of our commission uh, on sustainable intensification. It's not just to intensify, but it's just to, it's really to look at the landscapes and how to mitigate and adapt to climate change. We have to do all of that within planetary boundaries. And then we have, all in, in, on top of all of that, we have to realize that we don't take decisions. We in the commission or in universities or in 
sometimes even in governments uh, about farming systems, about uh, agriculture in general. We are talking about more than 500 million farmers. So this, this is a real, real big challenge uh, for agri-food, for sustainable agri-food systems in general. So that's the context where we, we started working in this commission. And uh, one way of summarizing all the gaps that we have is just to say three gaps. Uh, we have the food gap that I just mentioned, uh, how, how we're going to produce that without destroying our planet, meaning that we have a huge land gap. We are talking about 600 million hectares needed if we are going to produce what the demand looks like by 2050. So 600 million hectares is 10 times the arable land of Canada. And uh, so that's a lot of land. How to do that, how not to do that, how to intensify in order to protect and conserve the landscape. That's a huge land gap that we need to work on. And the, the, the third mention here is the mitigation gap. We are talking about the agriculture, agriculture in general, landscape use produces 15 gigatons of CO2. And the target for the big agreement is four gigatons. So we have 11 gigaton gap on the emissions, a lot to do. And as you will hear in the Brazilian case, there is a lot going on in research and innovation to reduce not only emissions, but try to come back and sink some of that. So anyway, big, big solutions, big challenges uh, and big solutions. Uh, now, for all of that, I, I am biased from the agricultural research perspective that we are not investing enough. So I just want to, this is another challenge. Uh, how we are going to cope? We are, we are talking about the global south, of course. Uh, we are not talking about highly developed countries, but uh, if you look at the, at the quickly at the numbers, Brazil is orange, China is yellow, at least in my, in my slide. But the big, the big blue there on top is high income countries. Those countries explain most of the spending or the investment in agricultural research. Low income countries are almost invisible. It's the dark green at the bottom. So with these trends, what I want to say is that um, how we are going to meet those challenges without investing in new knowledge. Uh, uh, this, this is big. So this is one of the key messages is that where, where, where is all of this funding going to come from to fill those gaps? Another way of looking at this is intensity. Intensity is very simple. It's for every hundred Canadian dollars produced in your farm. If you invest more than one Canadian dollar, that's a 1% intensity. And high income countries are investing about 3%. So $3 for every hundred dollars produced. But look at, look at the rest of us in the global south, very low, with the exception of Brazil and a few others, China is growing. I mean, anyway, so low income countries are investing less than one. It will be impossible to meet those huge challenges if we don't do something different. Now, so too little is spent on public R&D and on innovation, despite all of these documented returns, and I hope that some of you, the students and the professors, I'm, I'm confident that you all know the literature, huge rate of return to investing in agricultural research. However, uh, we are not yet there on the investments. So there is a lot of potential to catalyze these innovations to transform agri-food systems under climate change. Uh, that will involve a lot of rethinking of how research and innovation are part of a systemic change. Something has to be different. We don't think that after COVID, there will be plenty of new money for agricultural research. So we need to rethink how we do things. And we need much more uh, analysis of the feasibility of technological innovations and their impacts. The little scarce money that we're investing in research, are we sure that we are investing it in the right priorities or not? That's, that's a, big, a big discussion to have. So I won't, don't, don't, don't worry about this slide. All I want to say is that there's a lot of new innovations, well-documented coming from cellular to digital to food process. There's a lot going on, but it's mainly, it's mainly in the highly, in the more developed countries uh, for, for good reasons. And if you look at the intensification there, 
is visible, but it's not that visible. It's just one of them. And the colorful top of the screen are just the sustainable development goals that we all want to achieve. So there is a lot going on. And we in the commission are trying to see what's ahead, what will be the priority, uh, where to invest if we want to advocate for new investments. So the, the summary of what we see coming from the literature on intensification is that it is possible to feed by 2050 uh, 10 billion people without increasing emissions, without uh, continuing deforestation, etc. Et if we raise productivity, which is obvious, in the same land, we can produce much more, as you can see in there in the slide. If we link agriculture intensification with natural ecosystems, there is a lot going on in agroecology these days. And we think that the sustainable intensification is part of that consensus on how to produce more without destroying and how to um, conserve natural ecosystems and also promoting innovation. One thing is research and a different thing is innovation. So anyway, there are good things coming. So, so don't panic, uh, but uh, we need to do things a little different than we have done in the past. And I just, I just want to mention a couple of things that I, I didn't talk with uh, Brent on this one. I just, we, we found this in the website. To just have examples in Canada, we see, we see that of course, uh, Canada is always ahead in agriculture, but we see that Canada is really ahead on sustainable intensification. For example, with the no-till system started 20 or more years ago. So there's a lot going on in Canada in this. So this is not a remote thing coming from the global south. Uh, in fact, one of the challenges is how to adapt and adopt some of the practices uh, that you, you have invented in Canada. We also see, uh, this is a good example, the changes in farming methods in Canada have increased carbon sequestration 400 times, 400% since the 90s. Now, this is the missions, the prairie grain farmers. And I used to live in Minnesota looking at Canada when I was a student uh, on north of Minnesota. Uh, the prairie grain farmers, which are really productive, they are storing more carbon than they emit, according to some of the figures that we got in, the, in some websites. And you can see there, I'm sure you're familiar with this, and we can cover if there is time in the questions and answer how to expand and scale this up. So let me chat a little about the commission before I close and I, I give the floor to Mauricio. Uh, after all of these challenges, what are we doing? Well, um, as Dean Blade mentioned, um, we are funded by one of the CGR programs. The CGR is, is an international consortium of centers, public, working on applied research for development. We are 21 commissioners from the Global South, and the secretariat is based in one of the CGR centers. What we really want to do is to advocate. Uh, we want to influence global investments. Uh, we, are, we, we are not lobbyists. It's a big difference between lobby and advocate. We want to advocate to say, look, there is evidence here that there are a lot of innovations in agricultural systems that could be scaled up if we do A, B, and C, and not X, Y, or Z. And we want to foster some consensus on metrics because there are many summits and there are many reports, and we tend to agree on the big frameworks, but then who is going to measure that we are making progress? So we are, we are thinking on those two things. If we get, uh, if we can advocate based on evidence and if we have some metrics, basic metrics to follow the progress, we, we may have something to offer. The commission is only a two year commission. So we are going to evaporate at the end of this year. So we have a short time ahead. Now we want to increase availability and access to affordable, safe and nutritious food. We want to improve productivity. This is the key points that we want to advocate for. We want to improve the natural environment, improve social e equity, and reduce poverty. So we are looking at all of these studies. And don't worry again about this slide. It's just to uh, show some colors. There are a lot of studies. So we look at just 30, for example, of the 90 reports that we reviewed. Uh, we painted here how, how many of those are covering what related to cosine. And, and the conclusion is that not many look at the global south. 
And that was one of the reasons why the commission, may, we, are, we are looking at something to add value. So if you look on the right, uh, most of the yellow there is not focusing on the global south. If you look on the left, uh, most of the scope is global, uh, but it's not really particularly looking at the, at the global south. So we thought that we may have some space, not to duplicate, but to add some, some value. So we are looking at six questions. Um, one is to watch what, what, from all of these scenarios and futurology and foresight and reports, what's, what's really the, what's the three or four takeaways on the future of food and innovation to, to start this uh, uh, advocacy based on, on evidence. So we want to scan what's ahead from all of these reports. Second, we want to uh, measure how much is being investment invested in innovation. Uh, we know we, we have some good numbers of investments in research, but not too much on innovation in the global south. So if we can prove uh, that there is X invested, that will be the benchmark. So then we can advocate to say, well, perhaps a little more is needed. Third, we want to have examples. Perhaps the Brazilian example that you will see soon is a great example on the pathways for innovation. How to get there, not only to talk about big academic uh, good papers and books, but to say, okay, what's the pathway to, to be there? We want to work a lot on the innovation and the environment. We will see that uh, we, we believe that uh, the commission has a lot to offer on uh, the environmental aspect and the agroecology aspects and the ecosystem services aspects of innovation and also on social objectives, particularly on poverty, equity, and so on. And finally, as I mentioned, metrics. We would like to have a few metrics to say, well, if this is the benchmark what's been invested and we think there is a funding gap of X, how will be the metric to make progress? So with that, we are looking at um, not only technology, but we are looking at the policy framework, we are looking at the institutional framework, and we are looking about how much finance is really coming into sustainable agricultural intensification in the, in the global south. So we have a few things going on. Uh, the evidence on the left, those four things that I mentioned already, the investment, we are, we are coming very soon with a major uh, report on how much is being invested in, in innovation. We are estimating the investment gap. Uh, we are trying to get some good approaches and instruments and finally put some pathways and priorities on the table. We have our own networks, of course, to advocate. And we are doing this quite different from other uh, efforts. We are doing this in a public inquiry mode. So we say, well, we don't have all the answers, but we have lots of questions. How about coming and dialogue? So we are, we are organizing several dialogues on one of these six points. So this is what, who we are, a colorful picture from the Global South. And, uh, this is the, and there is a website that you can check and we keep posting their good news that we are getting from, from the commission. So, so with that, I, I, I hope I use no more than 20 minutes and uh, I let uh, my best friend in Brazil, Mauricio, continue with the good case of Brazil. Thank you. So thank you very much, Ruben. Uh, and yes, you took less than your 20 minutes, so good, good job. So Mauricio, you have plenty of time to tell us the case from Brazil. Uh, can you want to share your screen with us? Yes, uh, just, just a few words before I share my screen. Uh, my compliments to you all, it's uh, really, uh, great uh, to join Ruben and you all uh, in this lecture uh, to present and discuss with you innovations on sustainable agriculture intensification in the global south. Uh, before I start, I would like to congratulate all Canadian farmers and all of you dedicated to agricultural innovation in uh, this uh, very special day uh, in Canada. In the next uh, 30 minutes, I will try to complement uh, Ruben's uh, excellent talk, telling you uh, how sustainable agriculture is evolving in the tropics. I, I will use the case of uh, my country, Brazil, which uh, has uh, most of its territory in the tropical belt of the world. Uh, Brazil is really 
uh, an immense country, but most of our uh, 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 land is in the tropical belt. Many of you may be hearing a lot uh, of things about uh, Brazil over the years, some not so good uh, related to deforestation in the Amazon, wildfires in the Pantanal, qu questions related to uh, sustainability of our uh, uh, agriculture, among our other things. Uh, well, uh, this is obviously unfortunate, but obviously uh, these things don't tell all about uh, my country, uh, Brazil. And I hope uh, to convince you uh, uh, today that uh, the trajectory of the Brazilian agriculture in the past 30, uh, 40 years is really uh, amazing. It's impressive. And I will try to show you why illustrating uh, how research and innovation and a lot of investment in, the, in intensification practices are helping us to overcome problems and more than that, helping us uh, drive uh, our agriculture in the direction of uh, sustainability. I will share my screen now uh, with you, hoping that uh, you can see my slides. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're good. I hope it, uh, it's visible to all of you. So uh, what uh, I intend to do today is to uh, show you uh, what, uh, how uh, agriculture is evolving in the tropical belt with emphasis in uh, Brazil. I will divide this talk in, in three parts. Uh, the first part uh, on modernization and expansion of agricultural production in Brazil. The second part, uh, our investment in, in, in policies. Uh, Brazil has uh, done quite uh, well in passing public policies to uh, support uh, sustainability in agriculture. And uh, coming to the present and also thinking about the future, the challenges for intensification and also uh, the challenge of uh, uh, increasing multifunctionality in rural areas, bringing more synergy between agriculture uh, and the SDGs and the emerging uh, bioeconomy. Essentially, this is what I would like uh, to discuss with uh, you today, starting obviously uh, to tell you the obvious, how challenging it is to farm in the tropics. Uh, it's, it is in the tropical areas that we have uh, the more uh, intense uh, conditions, intense biotic and abiotic stresses, higher frequency of extreme events like flooding, waterlogging, heat waves, all this being uh, increased or intensified with the process of uh, climate, uh, climate change. Uh, climate change may even favor countries in the temperate areas, but uh, it can be catastrophic to countries like Brazil and countries in, 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 in sub-Saharan Africa that will have uh, these stresses tremendously intensified. Uh, contrary to what many people think that we have lots of fertile land, uh, it's not true. Uh, most of our soils are quite acidic and poor, as this uh, slide shows. The concentration of oxy salts in South America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Soils are quite acidic and nutrient poor, and it poses quite a bit of challenges to agricultural development. The other uh, uh, challenge in the tropical belt is uh, uh, this uh, uh, responsibility to avoid or to minimize uh, environmental degradation since most of the mega diverse countries are located in this region. This is the case of Brazil. Brazil is, uh, has uh, six uh, biomes. It's, it's quite diverse uh, with a very rich uh, uh, biological diversity. It's, it's a very uh, complex and fragmented uh, environmental resources. So very, very challenging to manage agriculture in such uh, uh, complex uh, and important uh, environments. Well, uh, because of all of this, uh, uh, Brazil was not a food secure country until uh, the 70s. We had a limited uh, understanding of this uh, uh, complex reality of our huge complex uh, territory. 
We had low agricultural production and low yields in, in, for most of our cropping systems, constant food supply crisis, widespread rural poverty. Brazil was known essentially as a coffee and sugar producer until uh, uh, the 70s. And we didn't have um, many ways to import uh, technologies from ad uh, advanced countries, which were uh, mostly in, in uh, the temperate areas because technologies were not fit or adapted to this uh, reality. Well, despite of all uh, this, in 40 years, Brazil has been able to develop a science-based advanced uh, tropical agriculture. And basically the reason is the investment that the country was uh, able to make in infrastructure, in education, in public policies, in support programs. Uh, and Bra Brazil invested quite a bit in, in, in institutional innovation, in partnerships, and in funding uh, 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 research and innovation. We develop our federal research system, which is Embrapa, the largest agricultural research uh, 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 organization in, in Latin America. Uh, lots of regional state uh, research uh, uh, institutes. Brazil has an excellent coverage of uh, agricultural universities, which are well distributed throughout the country. And more recently, a lot of uh, participation, a lot of investment from the private sector, including investment in R&D, not only in innovation. As I said, uh, Brazil consolidated the largest agricultural research organization in Latin America. Embrapa is uh, a, a large network of uh, research centers. We have 42 research units, uh, almost 10,000 employees, 2,400 scientists, a budget of around $1 billion, uh, which has been maintained uh, over the past uh, 10 years. Obviously, uh, we have a, a different situation now with the pandemics, but we hope it will be regular after that. And also quite a bit of cooperation, inclu including uh, scientific cooperation in, uh, in the US, in Europe. We have technical uh, uh, labs, we have labs uh, and technical cooperation. In, in different parts of the world, also in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Latin America. So fortunately, we, we have been able to build a state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure for uh, research and innovation in agriculture. I give you just a, one example of our leading uh, center in uh, sustainable intensification uh, uh, research, which is uh, located in the, the state of Mato Grosso, the interior, the western part of Brazil. Mato Grosso is the largest agricultural producer in Brazil uh, today. This is a very interesting center entirely dedicated to SAI uh, research. The other uh, important and distinctive feature of Brazil is the investment, uh, the spending in uh, research and innovation in, in a certain period of time. This, uh, this uh, uh, image shows you the, the Brazilian, uh, ran, Brazilian was 11th in terms of public agricultural research and development spending in the 60s. And by 2007, uh, we had jumped to the fifth position. So it was a, a huge uh, uh, impact that uh, the, 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 the increasing spending over this period uh, produced in our uh, innovation uh, system. It helped us to uh, really put in place uh, this uh, very interesting pathway of agricultural uh, innovation in the country that I try to summarize in, in, in a nutshell in, in, this, uh, in this image. First, a, a, a huge effort in expansion of agricultural production from the southern uh, tip of Brazil, which is more temperate, to the central part of Brazil, which is essentially tropical. After this, a lot of investment in competitivity and production of surplus that helped Brazil also to position itself as an important provider of food to the world, an important exporter. Brazil is, as a country, the second exporter of food and agricultural pro uh, products today. And then we moved in the past 15 to 20 years 
to uh, this, this sustainability challenge, uh, to increase sustainability, to remove uh, the, the, the difficulties, the, the footprints of this uh, first two phases. And we are now entering this uh, new phase of exploring uh, the multifunctionality of our agricultural systems to align our country with the SDG goals and also with the emerging uh, bioeconomy. Uh, the expansion was uh, very, of agriculture to the tropical area was very important to bring development to an area that was essentially a wasteland in the 70s. This uh, slide shows you the city of Sinop in the state of Mato Grosso, when this, this city was uh, created about 40, more than 40 years ago. It was just a clearing in this huge uh, 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 savanna. That there, there were nothing there. I took this picture in 2015, so this environment is completely uh, ch changed. So this the expansion of agriculture in this area was very important to bring uh, development and uh, to, to the interior of, of Brazil. So I tried to put uh, in one slide what were the, the big transformation uh, that uh, took place in our agricultural innovation system. Brazil, by uh, investing in institutions, investing in, 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 uh, in human resources uh, formation, in partnerships, was able to do these three things that were very important in these two first uh, phases. Uh, transform our acidic poor soils into fertile land, invest in the tropicalization of crops and animal production systems uh, that at, the, at, at that time in the 70s and the 80s, most of, our, uh, 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 most of the important agricultural uh, uh, species in Brazil were not tropicalized. And then uh, lots of emphasis in conservation practices and in managing risks. These three uh, developments were very key to help us advance and terrorize our uh, agriculture and to gain uh, competitivity and obviously to gain, uh, to become a food secure country. Like building soil fertility, this was a huge challenge to us. How uh, to, to farm these soils. This is a natural soil with the soybeans and soil with uh, fertility that has been built with uh, soybeans, a, a huge uh, difference. Uh, managing uh, crop nutrition, tremendously important. Uh, as you certainly know, oxysols are very uh, uh, complicated in terms of uh, 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 crop nutrition, like phosphorus. So uh, managing uh, nutrients like phosphorus and many others in an efficient way was also a big uh, challenge uh, to us that when it was uh, overcome, uh, crops uh, uh, achieved uh, the performances quite similar to performances in, 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 in temperate countries. Tropicalization of cropping systems was a huge development in Brazil. In the 60s, soybeans were adapted only to the southern tip of the country because it comes from a temperate area. So uh, using uh, 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 the genetic resources and the breeding, genetic enhancement, we've been able to bring soybeans to the tropical area of Brazil quite efficiently. Today we have soybeans grown all over uh, tropical Brazil. Nitrogen fixation was a tremendous advance. So our 38 million hectares of soybeans today use nitrogen fixation with a bacteria, rhizobia, that uh, is inoculated uh, in, in the plants and uh, fix all the nitrogen from the air. This means $15 billion uh, uh, savings for our farmers every year because we don't have to buy and apply uh, uh, chemical forms of uh, nitrogen to, to, to our crop. No till and uh, minimum till was a tremendous advance. Our soils are very sensitive and lots of concentrated rains, erosion is a big problem. And today most uh, cropping systems in uh, tropical Brazil use minimum or no till, uh, increasing carbon in the soil, saving water and preserving our soils. So it gave us uh, uh, the, the opportunity, this, this developments that gave us the opportunity to rapidly 
the bring uh, agriculture to the center and development to the central part of Brazil, helped uh, build our competitivity and our capacity to produce surplus and serve the world. Brazil is today an important provider uh, and exporter to more than 150 countries around the world. In a, in a summary, uh, the, the, the real impact of all this, this, uh, this uh, graph shows you the increase in uh, average yield of the main uh, crops developed in, in the tropical part of Brazil. From the mid 70s until the 2016, 17 season, we had 266% increase in yield. Production, total production, 386% increase in total production and still the, the amount of area needed for all this increase was only 33%. So technology driven efficiency helped us save land and increase uh, production in an efficient way. I, I call your attention to this last line, the red uh, line down here, which is the area of uh, double or multiple cropping in Brazil from mid seventies to today. It's a tremendous increase, it's 340%. This is a direct result of sustainable intensification. Uh, using the land which is already allocated to agriculture in a more efficient and a more intensive manner to save uh, obviously uh, land and to avoid a further pressure, especially to tropical forests or pristine areas. But the biggest uh, impact was food security. This graph shows you the cost of food in Brazil from the mid 70s to uh, uh, 2018. This is the cost of uh, the average package of uh, food for uh, an average family in Brazil. So the cost was cut by half. So uh, uh, food security, this was the, the big contribution of all this investment, all this progress to our, our society. And you see, the ups and downs here in this graph, the, 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 the regularity of prices and uh, the provision of food to uh, the Brazilian society also was a, a huge, a, a big gain. So I, I think this is one of the most important uh, uh, slides in this, in this presentation. And obviously, uh, for, for reasons that you know, in the past 10, 15 years, uh, sustainability became the, the first item in, in the agenda of society. Brazil is placing a lot of attention uh, to this, trying uh, with uh, its best capacity to overcome the footprints of the first two phases in uh, the environment. Brazil has passed uh, in 2012 a forestry code, which is a public law to limit expansion of agricultural uh, land and to concentrate development in areas which are allocated to agriculture. And also this law places uh, a responsibility to all uh, private owners of land that are, are now constricted to conserve water and biodiversity in their uh, land. Also Brazil has uh, be, been uh, developing for the past 10 years a low carbon agricultural plan. It's a quite, a quite bold plan to stimulate uh, uh, uptake of uh, conservation practices and to lower greenhouse gas emissions in its agriculture, especially incorporating technologies developed by Embrapa and uh, the Brazilian uh, universities and also the private sector. Like, uh, incorporating degraded, degraded land into more sophisticated agricultural production. Brazil has uh, still 50 million hectares of uh, degraded pastures. So uh, the country really doesn't have to cut one, one tree in, in the Amazon or anywhere else. We, it's, it's suffice to use this 50 million hectares of degraded pastures and we have plenty of technologies to do that to incorporate this land with uh, technologies with high efficiency, high productivity. Also intensifying the, the use of uh, the land which is already available to agriculture. And Brapa has developed technology that allow us to plant and to use the land 365 days a year. 
like in this in this graph, the, this uh, image is showing, we can plant uh, uh, short cycle soybeans in November, December, harvest it in January, plant immediately a corn with a grass, which is Bacchiaria, a very common grass in Brazil. When we harvest corn in June, we already have a pasture ready to be grazed. So with this kind of system, we have a first crop of corn, a first crop of soybeans, a second crop of corn, and a third crop of beef, so, so to speak. So this is uh, uh, really, the most advanced uh, sustainable intensification uh, in, in land use to avoid uh, pressure over uh, pristine and uh, forested areas in Brazil. And now we are bringing trees into this process, uh, combining crop, livestock, and forestry. Uh, forestry is a potent way to incorporate uh, carbon and to offset emissions from crops or from livestock. So we have a problem with our livestock pr production because we have a, a huge herd. We have a, a, as many cattle as we have people uh, in Brazil. So uh, emission of uh, methane is really a problem, but bringing cattle into this combination of uh, a crop, livestock and forestry is a way to offset the emissions of uh, methane used with a uh, forest. This uh, system is helping us to develop uh, carbon neutral uh, production systems like carbon neutral beef. Embrapa has uh, developed a certified low carbon production system and uh, a, a, a carbon neutral Brazilian uh, beef brand, which uh, has been uh, re released commercially uh, last, last year. And it's, it's very promising. So not only for beef, but also for other uh, types of uh, uh, protein production. So this is a, a very important uh, develop, uh, development to us. And as we uh, incorporate this concept of crop livestock forest, uh, we have also a huge opportunity to improve animal welfare, improve the environment. You know, to the, the tropics, lots of sunlight, lots of heat, this is uh, terrible for, for the cattle. So uh, uh, by bringing trees into the system, we improve a lot uh, animal welfare. Embrapa is developing metrics to show uh, how enhanced the environment and animal comfort can uh, be achieved in this kind of system, like reducing wind speed, reducing temperature, reducing radiation uh, reaching the ground, reducing the heat load and obviously uh, bringing uh, an environment which is more you know, uh, uh, safe and secure for, for the animals. This uh, kind of concept is attracting quite a lot of interest from the private sector. This is not done only by Embrapa. Embrapa today is teamed together with many uh, private companies that understanding the challenges that we have in the tropics and understanding that only through sustainable intensification practices we will be able to overcome this. They joined us in this uh, large network, which we call Hedge LPF, which is the, 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 the crop livestock forest uh, network. So we have now uh, new funding and new resources coming through uh, uh, private partners to uh, increase uh, or to disseminate these production systems and to keep obviously improving improving them. So uh, then I come to the last uh, part of uh, this presentation, which is uh, this uh, challenge that I, I think uh, our, uh, we have uh, all over the, the world, which is to better explore the multifunctional nature of agriculture. Agriculture is uh, of those uh, human activities uh, which are more, that have more functionalities. Uh, we can, uh, with agriculture, produce, uh, besides food, fiber, and bioenergy, we can work on food, nutrition, and health, which is a, a topic very important now that we have such a, a huge uh, health uh, crisis. Also, uh, agriculture uh, may uh, become a, a huge provider of environmental and ecosystemic uh, services, giving back to nature what was taken when agriculture was uh, 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 disseminated. 
biomass, biomaterial, the, 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 the connections of agriculture with the green chemistry and this emerging bioeconomy, biologicals, organic, uh, agroecology, agroforestry systems. So lots of opportunities here to develop systems which are better fit to, uh, to, to, to natural environments or to, 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 to better connected to the needs of uh, nature. And the last one that I like very much, this connection of food, culture, tradition, gastronomy, tourism. This is a huge opportunity, not only for Brazil, but our countries in, in the tropical belt. Like new kinds of fiber. Uh, Embrapa is developing naturally colored cotton, which uh, is an opportunity for the, 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 uh, the industry to, to save in the use of chemicals that are very nasty. Uh, uh, this biomass technologies and the connection with the green chemistry, biomaterials, and also a way to uh, provide environmental and ecosystemic services by fixing, taking uh, uh, carbon from the air and bringing it to the soil, uh, like sugarcane. Sugarcane uh, occupies only 1% of uh, the Brazilian uh, area, but it's, it, it provides a huge impact in our energy matrix. Brazil has the most uh, renewable energy matrix in the world, 45.3. This is three times the world average. Of that, 17.4% comes from biomass, from sugarcane uh, biomass. And not only uh, sugarcane, but also planted forests that are becoming major sources of feedstocks for different industries thinking about this new green deal and the, 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 the way to, to, to bring uh, more sustainability to different industries, especially chemi chemical industries. Biologicals, this is a huge thing uh, in Brazil now, uh, finding uh, uh, microorganisms and uh, biological systems that help us to uh, uh, fertilize crops in, in a more uh, creative ways, like with uh, uh, rhizobia in not only in soybeans, but in other crops. As I, as I said, this technology allow Brazil to save $14 billion every year. So it, one technology that was developed by Embrapa pays several times all the costs of agricultural innovation in Brazil. Biofactories that are supporting biological control and integrated pest management. Today, you can produce bugs and send them by the mail all over the country. So this kind of uh, uh, things are growing quite a lot with entrepreneurs, young people that are embracing agriculture and seeing in this uh, area of biologicals a huge opportunity uh, for, for the future. And as I said, uh, Brazil is a mega diverse country with a huge diversity, six fantastic uh, uh, different biomes, a, a, a lot of opportunity to work on this uh, uh, nexus of food, culture, tradition, gastronomy, as, also as a way to stimulate the tourism, not now, we hope very, very soon again, we, we, we are able to, to enjoy tourism. But you know, there is a growing demand for culturally diverse uh, food and food as an experience, new flavors, new tastes, textures, sensations, and so on. There is a huge opportunity here to, uh, uh, you know, to explore this uh, huge functionality that the natural environments and also agriculture provide to us. And uh, we think that this is uh, uh, very important for Brazil to be more, say, effective in responding to the, the sustainable development goals and also to, to synergize with this new economy, the, the circular economy, uh, which is emerging and which is uh, gaining uh, force. To, to finish, I just want to say that uh, uh, very good news is uh, all the, the fantastic development that we have in uh, the, 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 the world of science. Uh, up to now, we, we've been relying on what I call our traditional toolbox, genetics, statistics, chemistry, engineering. With this, we've been able to do a lot. We've been able to, to come to, to the present. But now there is a, a new toolbox emerging, and it's a very powerful toolbox. 
with new uh, and fantastic uh, uh, ways of dealing with uh, challenges in agriculture, gene addition, synthetic biology, big data, cloud computing, internet of things, robotics, uh, and, and so on and so on and so forth. So uh, this, these things are really amazing and, and, and impressive. And uh, they show us that the, the future and including the future of sustainable intensification will be very intensive in knowledge, but not only in knowledge, because it's going to be very difficult uh, to uh, embrace out or to take out these new tools, all these new possibilities, if we don't build new relations. So I think we have to think about the future, which is will is already, but it will be even more intensive in knowledge and relations. So we have to excel in uh, you know, acquiring and using new knowledge and building new relations. I think this is very important for us in this world of uh, uh, research and innovation that we understand well the challenges for research and development, for the way we develop our projects, the need to, uh, to, 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 to have interfaces with the private sector so that we, we transform knowledge in innovation. But we have now to think about this new dimension here, the, the entrepreneurs, the young people that are you know, uh, embracing this new fantastic tools and the new fantastic knowledge that is emerging and gaining interest, including in agriculture. It's amazing uh, how agriculture in Brazil is attracting young people, young entrepreneurs. I'm sure in the audience right now, there are many young people that are already uh, doing this or thinking about it. So, but I, I think we have to be more prepared to it. Uh, we that uh, you consolidated our contributions in the research and development and innovation realm, understand that there are new possibilities. There is a new world for, uh, for innovation and uh, the challenge is to find creative ways to embrace it and to use it to help us uh, bring agriculture uh, closer and closer uh, to, sustain to, to sustainability, which I think is what uh, uh, society expects uh, from us. And I think this is all about uh, a co-sci, uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, to, to target knowledge important for sustainable intensification and to target new opportunities to uh, create and to enhance and to empower relations so that we can uh, use sustainable intensification to help uh, the world uh, move in the direction of, uh, you know, uh, uh, food security for all and peace uh, for all. Uh, if there is no food security, probably we cannot dream uh, with peace uh, in, the, in the future. So it, it's, it's a huge challenge and that it's a big responsibility to all of us. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been really great to be here with you uh, today. Thank you. Uh, so Mauricio, uh, thank you very much. That's such a tour de force as well as such a positive presentation. I don't think I've seen a a presentation about global agriculture uh, as positive as yours. So coming on the heels of Ruben's kind of bad news story to hear this uh, fantastic story from Brazil and the graph that really caught my attention, I guess, was seeing only 30% increase in the area of crop production at the same time as you know, 100 for two, two to 300 increases in, in yield is really news to me. I, I think it's really, really something. So. so Perhaps you could stop sharing your screen. We can see more hands and have a little bit more of a dialogue as we go forward. Just to let everyone know, um, there, I'm not sure what, what screen you see, but there are about 150 people uh, joining us today, which is a, a nice turnout. So thanks everyone uh, for um, spending your afternoon with us. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, so we can take questions in through the chat or if people would, I can see some hands as there is uh, arise. So if people would like to, to, to make a, a verbal question, please uh, hit the kind of hand button under the more, the more button you can see, click more, I think you can get 
So I don't know, but somehow I think you can you can show a hand uh, to flag that you would like to ask a question. If you do, if I don't see you, please just unmute yourself and speak up. Perhaps with starting with introducing yourself. In the uh, Brendan, the if you open the participants list, then at the bottom there's a little thing to raise your hand. So okay, or thank you. Can, Ellen. can type them into the chat box. I'll keep an eye on the chat box. Yeah. So Helen McDonald is uh, the chair of renewable resources, and she's helping us to moderate the questions. I have a, we have a question from Robert Grant. Um, so the first C is, uh, does rock phosphate continue to be a key amendment for building soil fertility and acidic soils? If so, are future supplies adequate? I think that's a question from Riccio. Yes, yes. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, it was quite important uh, uh, a few years back in, in, in the 70s and, and the 80s. Not uh, much uh, today, but Today, there is a new tendency in Brazil, which is uh, uh, bioavailability, looking for microorganisms that can be, uh, that can help us mobilize phosphorus from uh, 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 sources, so rock sources found in Brazil. Most of the phosphorus used in, in Brazil is uh, imported. Our uh, natural sources have low uh, availability of uh, phosphorus. In the past, we used uh, uh, rocks uh, 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 that are ground as a way to, to help uh, uh, fertilization, but that is not common uh, uh, today anymore. We see it as an opportunity since phosphorus is a very expensive component of, of uh, the fertilization of our crops to find new ways to solubilize phosphorus from our uh, sources. Uh, this is, there is quite a lot uh, going on in Brazil in terms of research in this area of uh, bioavailability of nutrients and with a lot of emphasis in, in phosphorus. This, this is what we are doing uh, today in this, in this area. Thank you. Uh, I have another, we have another question uh, for you, Mauricio, on Brazil is, uh, and I think this is, you know, the backdrop I think is that we keep seeing news stories about deforestation in Brazil, uh, you know, perhaps uh, higher rates of deforestation just in the last few years than there had been. So the question is, what's the reason for so much deforestation if there's plenty of unused or degraded pasture land? Well, there is no need for deforestation in Brazil. So, and, uh, and most of this, uh, the, the deforestation that we have in the country uh, right now, they are not really related to agriculture or agricultural expansion. Uh, uh, there is unfortunately uh, quite a bit of it uh, going on related to logging and also to illegal mining in, in, in some parts of, of, of the Amazon. So th there is absolutely no need for deforestation for uh, uh, Brazil to expand its agricultural production. I showed you we have we have plenty of land to uh, to use in a more efficient way and to double or triple of, of our, uh, our agricultural production. Brazil has 50 million hectares of uh, degraded pastures, land that was cleared, opened in the 70s and in the 80s. So uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, obviously, the government is looking for ways to uh, counteract it. It's, it's a case of police. It's, this is not related really to agriculture and agriculture, uh, agriculture expansion. It's mostly illegal logging and illegal uh, mining going on, especially in some parts of the Amazon. Thank you. Um, so we have a question. Um, is I think that what Brazil is doing is incredible. One question, Mauricio, is I've read some projects from Sao Paulo on the introduction of urban vertical farming and urban centers. Unfortunately, the cost is a huge barrier to this innovation. Do you see urban or slash vertical farming and urban centers as a growing industry in Brazil? Is Embrapa interested in this? Yes, very much. Embrapa is interested in, in this. It's gradually being developed. We have our vegetable centers he, center here in Brazilia doing quite a bit uh, in, in, this, in this area. 
Brazil has uh, very interesting experiences with peri-urban agriculture around the big centers like Sao Paulo, Belém, still not much uh, on urban uh, farming, but with the new technologies uh, now for uh, very sophisticated greenhouses, uh, lightning and, and, and things like this. So the possibility, especially to produce uh, vegetables in uh, within the cities, uh, th this is uh, something, yes, we are, we are taking it seriously. And Embrapa is, uh, yes, developing research uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, I see that Ruben has his hand up. Uh, Ruben, please chip in. Yeah, no, just I, I, I understand that. Uh, thank you, Mauricio, for such a fantastic presentation. No, I understand that uh, towards the end of uh, winter, Canadians are really, really interested in Brazil uh, and uh, for many reasons. But uh, I, I just wanted to say the, the point is, is a fantastic example. It, there is only one Brazil. I'm not negative. I am I, on a. I, I want to challenge. We have 150 mines here, and you know how many Brazils are out there. So if you take Brazil, China, India, South Africa, and uh, five more countries, the other 80 low lower income and low middle income countries are really far away where Brazil was 40 years ago. So it's not negative, but just to put that the, the gap of investment and innovation is really in the global south as a total uh, is growing. So we can learn a lot from Brazil and perhaps I'm not do so patient. So my comment is that uh, perhaps uh, uh, by intensifying, by investing, by rethinking institutional change also, we don't have to wait for the years for other countries in the tropics to, to, to do it. So that's, that's a, the big challenge that the commission is trying to to address, but the, the example of Brazil is fantastic. We, 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 we need to find ways of scaling that up in other places. Thank you. I see Stan so, has uh, his hand up, Brent. Yeah. Go ahead, Stan. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Stan. Oh, uh, I think... Um... I think okay. Rahana has to give him permission to unroute. So maybe do one from the chat box. So, so maybe, so just, uh, I have a question and, and I asked two. Um, I, Ruben and Mauricio, uh, I was surprised at the relatively low percentages of agricultural GDP spent on research in China and India. So in India, you showed numbers that there's been a large increase in absolute terms but it still makes it quite low in percentage terms. And I wonder what, because that's, you know, as Ruben hinted, that's where we might want to hope the next Brazil to be, might be China or India or other countries. And I wonder if you have reflections on what might be holding back those two countries from, you know, really embracing innovation and agriculture the way that Brazil has. Well, well the, the numbers I presented is, is about public agricultural research. And the study that we are conducting at the moment is trying to put some numbers on the rest of it. So the total number may be much bigger than the one I show, which is only public research. China alone today is investing much more than the USA in public agricultural research. So we know that. We still don't know, we are trying to estimate how much is going on with the private sector in other countries and also in total investment in innovation. But still in general public research is still low, still low. And I, I'm not thinking it's linear. I don't think we need to do public research first and then wait for innovate. Everything is part of a system, but it's very low, it's very low. So we are trying to get that uh, answer as soon as we have it, Brent, we can share the report that we have contracted to estimate what, how much is really going on in those other countries uh, like India and Brazil. We know it's a lot. Public is not too much in India. It is a lot in China. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to make sure that uh, people who have asked their first question, uh, we read their questions first. So we have one. Um, how have you been able to convince the youth in Brazil to get along with the vision of your projects in agriculture? Well, 
uh, th this is this is a very very inter interesting question. Uh, uh, Brazil is a very special case in terms of uh, uh, attraction uh, to, uh, especially to young people. Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, young people are inheriting uh, the farms and they are keeping uh, on and they went to good universities, came, uh, came back. Well, it, it's not really us uh, in a research organization uh, finding creative ways to attract uh, young people to agriculture. It's, it's the reality uh, of Brazil, it's the, the way that uh, uh, agriculture is growing and expanding. It's the number of uh, uh, private businesses uh, disseminated throughout the country and uh, uh, assuming the responsibility of uh, being uh, big players. So it, it, it kind of shows to, to young people uh, that there is opportunity there. And uh, this wave of entrepreneurship is being uptaken in, in Brazil in a, in a very impressive uh, manner. Uh, all the big players in uh, agriculture innovation in, in the world, they are in Brazil and they are investing in uh, uh, entrepreneurs and they are putting money in small uh, uh, ventures, you know, to solve specific uh, problem. So there is uh, uh, an environment, an, uh, uh, an innovation environment in, in Brazil, which is today very attractive to, to young people. Young people are seeing opportunity there. Uh, they are uh, uh, expectant that uh, agriculture will continue to be uh, important uh, and it con will continue to evolve. Uh, in, in Brazil, and that will provide good good opportunities. And uh, so, I, I think it's it's more the the environment uh, in in the country uh, around agribusiness and agriculture innovation, uh, taking only not only the advances in the public but also in 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 the private sector, which are making uh, the, the 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 agricultural. Uh, uh, arena quite attractive to young people in, in the country. If you allow me, in, in the previous comment of uh, uh, Ruben, I'd like just to flag one thing that was very important uh, in Brazil, which was, uh, you know, uh, we've been able to build capacity in the public domain and to create a concept of, uh, you know, uh, uh, public uh, research as a, a, a like a, a clean a cleaning track train in 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 Brazil a public investment is done to uh, make available uh, you know uh, institutions that operate like a cleaning track train that go up front uh, embracing the most difficult. Uh, 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 time-consuming challenges that are, are not usually embraced by the private sector because they are too risky. So what happened in Brazil, the government was able to take the risk and to pay for it. And uh, Embrapa is like a cleaning track train. So we develop uh, knowledge that stimulates the private sector to come to uptake it and to transform it in, in, in innovation. And then we in Brapa, we move to something else. <laughs> uh, so this concept of public investment uh, to build institutions that operate like a cleaning track train, I think it's very key for other countries that want to say to mimic what happened uh, in Brazil. Well, cool. so we have a, the Stan uh, entered his question into the chat. So I'll just read his and then go back to Maya. Um, so Stan asks for both Ruben and Mercio, how does COSAI and Brazil balance export agriculture with domestic food security and affordability? Well, so far we, we are looking at global food security. So if Brazil exports a lot, uh, Latin America in general exports much more than Canada, US, and Australia all together, and Europe, uh, is, is good for global food security. Uh, we are not looking at the national level and the trade-off 
between how much you export and what's go going on inside on food security uh, yet. So, so that, that, that will be my answer. Thank you. Recio and Brazil. Well, uh, Brazil is a, is a big agricultural nation and it will continue to be. Brazil is an important provider of uh, food and agricultural pro products uh, to the world and it will continue to be. As a country, Brazil today is the second exporter of uh, uh, agricultural uh, products. Obviously, uh, food security in Brazil is essential to us. It's our high priority. And obviously, we don't want to, uh, to increase uh, uh, agricultural output in Brazil at the cost of our environment, even though you see in the media all the time that uh, we, 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 we are not careful with uh, our environment. Brazilian farmers are very aware that uh, uh, to be an important uh, uh, global player, in uh, this area of uh, 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 food security and uh, uh, to provide food to, to the world, you have to be careful with what you do in your country. So yes, I, I think uh, our main priority obviously is uh, the Brazilian uh, people, uh, as food security in Brazil, but uh, we feel that we can uh, go on contributing with the food security uh, uh, throughout the world. And uh, I think Brazil will uh, 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 try to excel in its capacity to produce a surplus in a sustainable and responsible way and uh, being an important player in, uh, for food security at the global level. Thank you. Ellen, do you want to uh, field pop polls a few of the questions? Uh, sure, I'll go to Maya's question. Um, so this is from Maya Evidan. Are many agriculturalists in the global south, in Brazil and elsewhere, considering insect production as an animal protein source that can be produced on smaller footprints than, um, than of land than cattle? Uh, perhaps uh, Mauricio has examples from Brazil. Well, uh, we, we've been looking at uh, on a different, not, not as part of the commission, what's going on with alternative protein or additional sources of protein, not alternative. And um, as far as I know, uh, um, there is not, I mean, there is a lot of interest and cu curiosity, but not yet a major initiative looking at insects as a, as a new way of, uh, of of alternative or, or additional protein yet. Uh, we know there is research going on, but not, not at the scale of the rest of the research. And that's why the projections are that the traditional natural beef, uh, carbon neutral, hopefully, uh, will continue to grow. That demand will continue to grow. Perhaps Mauricio has examples from Embrapa. Thank you. Yes, uh, we, we are doing uh, uh, research on that, uh, not uh, looking at uh, insects as food, uh, more as insect as uh, eventually as uh, a source of feed. For instance, insects may be a, a fantastic way to feed the fish. So uh, since there is quite a bit of emphasis in aquaculture in Brazil, uh, insects may be an interesting way to reduce the cost of feed for fish and eventually other animals. I'm a bit concerned with this alternative right now because of the pandemics, you know? When you, you think about uh, bringing uh, other animals uh, into, into the process, there is always uh, the risk of uh, zoonotic diseases or, you know, uh, viruses uh, transitioning from insects to uh, 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 cultivated uh, uh, animals like fish. So I, I think uh, we will have to be extra careful as we consider this, uh, this alternative, especially when tagging wild populations uh, of insects and trying to adapt them to, to such kind of uh, use. But yes, we, we see it as an opportunity uh, for Brazil is not exactly to use it as a food, but we see an, an interesting opportunity to use it as a source of protein uh, in feed, especially for uh, uh, aquaculture. Okay, do you want me to do the next one, Brandt? Sure. 
Um, so the question is from Solby CEO. Uh, the question is, uh, how well received is cyclic farming uh, by the private sector? So this is incorporating plants, trees, livestock throughout the year. Um, is it well received by the private sector? How many participating companies since the launch of the program? And were there additional incentives for companies to conduct cyclic farming besides getting a certificate? It's tremendously well received. Uh, we have uh, today many, not only private companies, but uh, co-ops, large, Brazil has large co-ops. Co-ops are a fantastic way to, to solve problems, especially for small uh, farms uh, uh, in Brazil, because it's a way to remove uh, market imperfections and, and so on. So uh, uh, co-ops are helping us to disseminate this kind of technologies. Uh, we are uh, teaming together with uh, banks that have interest in financing uh, farmers, uh, large agribusiness uh, companies like uh, John Deere, uh, 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 Syngenta, and others uh, that are uh, working together with us, supporting uh, the development of these technologies uh, and the dissemination of these uh, uh, technologies. Obviously, there is a challenge here. Uh, a, a, a person that was used or consolidated its, uh, say, farm with cattle production only, now you have to also produce crops and also have uh, 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 trees or uh, forestry in, in, in your system. It's a challenge for the farmers to incorporate these new responsibilities, these new uh, challenges. And the private sector is helping us uh, with, with that. Uh, for some uh, systems, we will need new machinery, new, new kind of uh, automation, which fits better uh, mixed and uh, more complex uh, systems. So, uh, but the answer is total engagement. The private sector in Brazil has uh, comprehended that we have to move really fast uh, with uh, sustainable intensification and uh, with increase in sustainability in our systems, uh, incorporating more carbon in our soils, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This is very key for the competitivity of uh, agriculture in Brazil in the future and, and private uh, 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 enterprises, they understand that quite well. Thank you. Okay, one more. Uh, this is from Melinda Villacaranthna. And the question is, what is the farmer's perspective towards the beneficial microorganisms based commercial products other than rhizobia inoculants? So I don't know if that's for Ruben or Mauricio. I, I don't have an answer for that one. Uh, so I don't know. Yes, uh, well, uh, uh, I do have a perception on, on that. Uh, there is uh, today a, a wave of uh, development in this area of uh, biologicals. So it's, it's called generally the biologicals. Uh, how to find uh, biological solutions to problems that are solved with chemical solutions. It's basically to substitute chemicals, uh, pesticides, and even uh, fertilizers, chemical fertilizers by, let's say, safer uh, and uh, uh, biologically based uh, systems. There is a, a huge acceptance uh, to it uh, in Brazil. Brazil has today even a public policy to stimulate it. Our Ministry of Agriculture has a, a public program to uh, support developers of these new uh, new solutions, it's it's a quite big program with uh, quite a lot of resources, which are directed to those that are uh, uh, trying to develop and uh, trying to make these uh, uh, options available in the market. Embrapa already has some products uh, developed and released. We had the first one, the most important and the most successful is Rhizobia, which is very effective in uh, nitrogen fixation in, in the tropics. We have high rhizobia. We have also azospirillum, which is another microorganism that is involved in, uh, in this. 
we have we have microorganisms that are help release phosphorus from tropical soils. This is a huge problem in Brazil because our soils they uptake most of the, the phosphorus that are, is is applied in our crops is uh, heavily bound to the oxysols. So we are now using microorganisms to uh, remove this uh, attraction or to uh, release uh, like weak acids that uh, reduce the attraction of phosphorus uh, to the soil and make it more available to plants. So yes, there is a lot of things going on uh, right now in this area of biologicals. Uh, microorganisms and insects that are used for biological control, companies that are being developed, these multinationals that are developing this uh, in Brazil. So the area of biologicals is, is really huge and it's growing uh, day by day. And a lot of entrepreneurs in this area, okay? Uh, there is this firm that was developed in Sao Paulo, well, students from the uh, University of Sao Paulo that developed a company to provide uh, uh, biological control uh, insects to country to, to to farmers all over the country, so they pack them in a very specific way. They send them by mail so that they can be released in the crops, and it's been very effective. So yeah, quite a lot of that here, and not much resistance. Sir, uh, people are is really not afraid of this. Uh, uh, this way of doing things. Obviously, we ha you have to do it carefully because dealing with microorganisms, viruses and uh, bacteria, you have to do it obviously following all the protocols of biosafety, which we are obviously doing. So that's been, uh, that has been a really impressive set of answers to these questions. Thank you very much to all the audience members uh, for chipping in. We're just, I'm just going to I'm going to pose one question myself to, to both of you uh, as a wrap up, and then I'll pass back to Ellen, who will guide us for the rest of the, uh, this, this session of the, of the lecture. Um, so Ruben, thinking about COSI, um, where, so there's one Brazil, as you said, we are ho hoping that there are lessons to be learned from Brazil for elsewhere. So if you were choosing a country from Africa that would be uh, if Mauricio wasn't available and no one from Brazil was available and you were choosing from Africa, where, where might you choose a country in Africa where you see things trending in the right direction with public investment and an innovation system which is kind of mutually beneficial as, as we've learned about for Brazil? Okay, uh, there's a lot of questions that we, we have not prepared before uh, for the audience, so that is good, good question. Well, Africa, has 50 countries and um, it's very hard to pick one. But I would say for, for what I've seen working there on and off, um, there are more than 10, 12 countries that are really coming up very, very strong in innovation. Uh, you know, we, we, for example, in the commission, we are doing a, a very deep case study on Kenya because there is more data there and more universities and more availability of colleagues but uh, also in West Africa is huge. I, I've seen uh, initiatives on sustainable intensification from the private sector, from uh, producer associations, as Mauricio says, from universities, from IIDA, where Stan Blade used to work, and, uh, and many other centers uh, really, really promoted. So I would say, they, uh, you know, the challenges is huge, Brent, because there are 50 countries, and I, I think there are 10 or 12 that are really ahead of the rest. And, uh, and we will see how, how that, there is a lot of South-South um, potential cooperation. Brazil has been a leader on that one too, on, on how, how, you know, uh, Latin America, uh, Africa, and even Asia can work together a bit more. Since before you go, I know that we have to close, but I just want to, to first to thank you again, uh, everybody for the invite and for your patience to be with us for more than an hour. Uh, you know, the challenge that we have in, in the commission and the challenge for sustainable intensification are huge, but they are doable. They are, I mean, you, you can just saw one example, but there are many more examples that invested in the proper priorities, you can get ahead. But uh, the, the point I want to make is that this, this issue on sustainable intensification is, is not, I mean, we are calling it the global south, but it's also Canada is there because it's a global issue. 
it's a global issue. I'm sure you have a lot of international students at the university, a lot of Canadian students, professors who are very international. So this is not a better time. When I was a student, it was not such a good time because agriculture was kind of out of the map. Now, if you look at the slide from Mauricio, that agriculture is connected to everything. This is a great time to be a student or to be a professor in this topic. And I hope we can collaborate uh, the university uh, that you represent with the commission, with investors and with other things after the commission ends, because I think uh, Canadian universities are very well connected in addition to government programs from Canada that are helping a lot on, on sustainable intensification. So I, I hope this is only the appetizer uh, I am much more positive that perhaps some of my slides, and I think there is a bright future there if we, if we collectively work a bit more together. So thank you again for the invite. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll, it's time to move to the next uh, portion of our program, and that's a really good segue because we are gonna move to the uh, student posters. But before we do that, I just wanna give a really sincere thanks to our two uh, speakers, Dr. Echeverria and Dr. Lopez, for a really fascinating presentation, both on the challenges that we face and also uh, some good news stories about what can actually be achieved through knowledge and relations aimed at sustainable agriculture intensification and I have to say, I really enjoyed what Mauricio said about the value of adding trees into sustainable agricultural systems. That was my bias. So thank you so much. And also to uh, everyone that posed the questions. It was a very interesting discussion. I really appreciate uh, the fact that people contributed there. So thanks to our audience. Um, I also need to support, uh, thank our supporters. So the Waterland and Ecosystems Research Program uh, that convenes the Commission on Sustainable Agriculture Intensification as part of the 1CG system, and also the Alberta Canola Producers Commission. I also do want to thank um, everyone that supported the Bentley Lecture and the Bentley Lecture Endowment in the past. And uh, we very much look forward to our next Bentley Lecture when we're all going to be in person, shaking hands in close quarters and meeting in person and uh, enjoying refreshments afterwards. <laughs> Uh, finally, I want to thank uh, those who helped organize this year's lecture. So uh, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Brent Swallow uh, and also Dr. Robert Grant from Department of Renewable Resources for helping organize this. Uh, Rahana Bennett and Christy no Nohos for providing administrative and organizational support. And uh, finally, Miles Dick, uh, Dr. Miles Dick for helping to organize the poster session. 